introduce uh, two of the publishers that have been working with CRO in one capacity or another. It's um, Ray Letkowski from Gale Research. CRO has been working with Gale. We have been um, in two capacities. We've uh, been negotiating on behalf of CRO libraries the access and purchase of, of some major databases that Gale publishes. Um, on the second way we've been working with Gale is that Gale has been providing us um, metadata for uh, from their big databases, particularly big newspaper databases, for inclusion in the ICON database, which is a registry of um, newspapers that have been either microfilmed, digitized, or preserved in paper form. And so Gail has been giving us the metadata on the databases of, of newspapers that they have digitized. And so that's provided a lot of very good, actionable information for us, so and for for you, it's an icon's an open access database uh, that will tell you what you don't need to digitize, um, and it will also tell you what's held in paper, what's held in microphone as well. So, um, ProQuest, we've had a relationship with going back a ways. We have negotiated some um, arrangements, terms of access, in terms of purchase for database published by ProQuest as well. But we've also, uh, ProQuest has also done some digitization of CRL collections. ProQuest produced a large collection of um, published serials, historical serials, mostly late 19th or 20th century serials from the CRL collection. They digitized that some years ago. And so um, the one of the obligations that ProQuest has in return for being able to digitize from these is that we, we don't want to have to continue to service the physical copies at zero member expense. So uh, ProQuest has agreed to provide an archiving solution for those digital files. And so we're keeping paper, but we, we don't want to have to service it. So uh, welcome, Susan, and welcome, Ray. We, um, we were interested in the publishers because these particular publishers go back a long way with libraries. Um, they go back to the, micro, the dawn of the microform era when we all walked on four, four legs and, and the, um, the, work, the earth was shrouded in mist. And um, they, in the, about the 50 years since the beginning of the microfilm era, they um, aggregated a lot of important content that libraries were unable to aggregate for one reason or another. That um, ProQuest, and Gale microfilmed important collections that were in public institutions, private institutions, national institutions, and and has those has created microfilm masters for those and certain amount of control maintains certain amount of control of them. Um, they've also invested quite a bit since the 1990s in digitization of some of those assets, some of those microform assets. Not all of them. Not near, in fact, we suspect not nearly all. Of them. Um, but in some, so we, and we invest in those databases. We buy the New York Times historical newspapers and we buy 19th century collections online, those kinds of things, a lot of generated from, from microfilm content. The problem is we don't know um, how much is in the vault versus how much is out there in the, in the sphere. And so if we're gonna have to make decisions about what we continue to maintain in our libraries, and not only what we continue to maintain, but how we continue to maintain them. What kind of climate control conditions we, in, we provide for them, what kinds of monitoring of those materials we provide, shelf reading, that kind of thing, deacidification, conservation, that kind of thing. All those decisions will have to be made, on, or should be made, on the basis of knowing what's already been done terms of microfilm. So that's the, uh, that's the context for our discussion today. Um, because you already know a lot about um, ProQuest and Gale, I won't, I won't ask um, Ray and uh, Susan to talk about ProQuest and Gale. We'll, and we'll launch right into the, right into the discussions. Um, so what about making the microfilm vaults more, what about further better disclosure of what's in the microfilm vaults? Is that a, easy thing? Is that a hard thing? Is that an expensive thing? Is that a That's a needed thing. thing. I, think. I think it's something that we need to do. The, the issues we think with both publishers is over time we've acquired many collections. We've acquired other companies. We've acquired film that we no longer have rights to, etc. 
Um, however, on the Gale side, we do have two pretty good resources that are open to the public for finding the type of microphone collections we hold. Um, there's the gale.com site, which is, if you go to the products, you can limit by micro, microfilm or microfiche and see the holdings we have. Um, there's also a, a site that we have that goes much deeper than that and gives you title level information, um, which is the old primary source media site. Um, the problem with it, uh, again, is I, do, I don't think it is comprehensive. So there is an opportunity here with CRL to look at how can we give you more information about what's at the title level. We obviously have the information for internal purposes, um, just a lot of times that is an external list. Um, and I will echo what Bernie said, is, which is we've only digitized a small amount. It's millions and millions and millions of pages, but as far as what the holdings are that, that Cengage has, um, it's very small. You know, the percentage, would you guess? I would, I would gather that, I would, I would say it's less than 5%. Less than 5%. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, again, millions of pages, but the, the aggregate of everything that we hold in our vault, um, it's very small. And, I, and I'll, I'll pass on to Susan here, but I do want to say, just from a preservation standpoint, that um, we do have all of our microfilm, our first generation microfilm, held at Iron Mountain. That's where we store everything in a climate-controlled yeah, climate environment as well as we have a duplicate of that available for customer uh, creation. So we do have a pretty good sense of the, um, you know, the importance of, of maintaining that archival data, because at the end of the day, it's a huge asset to us, right? So <coughs> it's, a, it's a huge thing that we take very seriously, and maintaining those, those masters is something that we, you know, we look forward. Um, you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, uh, Susan Belkin from ProQuest. Um, so I took over the um, the microform group March 1st this year. So I'll tell you uh, what I know. And uh, essentially, uh, when we look at our across all our collections, so in microfilm, um, it's more than a billion pages. In fact, I, I, I've seen it going up to quite a billion. Approaches the national debt. But we're, I was look, looking at the numbers, and we've, we've had this calculated, um, obviously, before. But also, please remember that um, some of the microfilm in the past has been sold off, or it's been acquired. We also purchased the UPA microfilm, the, um, the government statistical microfilm, microlog from Canada. Our biggest collections, of course, are the dissertations um, and newspapers. And so when we, we put it all together, I, I hired someone um, to come in, that, that person starts on Monday, to help us pull together um, a, a very more detailed inventory list that combines all of our uh, microfilm collections. And so we will have, uh, I will have more of a detailed inventory um, to give you by guessing by fall or by year end. Um, we do have the UMI uh, microfilm little collection uh, on our website that's also going to be being searched. Um, so then, you know, a lot of the, the collection is um, known or available or made public, and that's our intention to publish it on our website. So that's, it's not that we're trying to make it a secret, it's, it's that we're trying to pull together the correct inventories and what we have currently today. Yeah. So it's, um, those are kind of the numbers. It's well over a billion pages. I think it's, it's from the numbers I've seen, it's worth of that. Um, yeah, one of the challenges that we've seen is, is that even when the numbers are disclosed, that it's they're not structured in a way you can compare. So we, you know, we can't compare them yet. I mean, in truth, so that's what we're pulling together now. I mean, in fact, I was smiling when I was looking at some of the data that I pulled from our UMI and, and the EPA microfilm, and it turns out Norman Ross, I think, sold it to both. You know, Norman, so Norman Ross is the mystery man here. Yeah, yeah, so Norman, Norman Ross, I don't know if people know yeah. about Norman Ross. <laughs> Many people know Norman was somebody who made his living uh, traipsing through the, the mountains of Eastern Europe, uh, signing up small newspapers and microfilming right. their, their publishers, their back files. And that Norman had got amazing things. There was a lot of suspicion that Norman really worked for the CIA. <laughs> and it's possible. But, uh, but Norman accumulated an enormous body of very, very important material, important material from you know, microfilm of newspapers that are long gone, where the offices were destroyed in the Balkan War, 
and that kind of thing. And so there's a tremendous amount of, but, but then he sold his, the whole thing to, to ProQuest five years but ago. Also to UMI. And to UMI. Yeah, so and UMI and also to UPA collection, which is interesting. So we're, we're reconciling those now. Um, I we think it's about 118 million pages and about 25 million is in the Soviet area, roughly. Mm -hmm. But we're, again, we're, we're doing another inventory go at this and try to do it as complete as we can at the subject level, category, subject, um, title level. We think each one is complete, but we don't know yet until we thought of that. But you'll have more data. I mean, I think this is incredibly important. I don't know. People agree. Is this there's is an obsession that I've developed working yeah, at CRL for too long? Fantastic that you're both going to do that. Um, I was just going to ask that question. Norm, is Norman Ross the IDC, or is that is that another? Company? Well, that's the that's ECU, the same. IDC. Well, ECU, yeah. ECU. Yeah. 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 They're he was different. I, I, don't know the details there, but Eastview does also have a collection. But that I can't well, I can't say this. We we are talking to Eastview about our collection and their collection to see what we have because <laughs> we're kind of friend, they were friends, as they say. Thank you. So, so title lists are, are one thing, and those are pretty pretty easy to provide. But there's a few caveats, especially in the world of, of Gale and the historic newspapers that we've done. Um, the problem is, is that there are gaps that exist within these newspapers. So we can say we have a certain title, but we may not have the entire holdings of that run. And there's many reasons for that. Um, the most typical ones are we can only digit, we can either digitize or film the holdings of the institution that we make an agreement with. So if for some reason the institution doesn't have that holdings, those holdings, we don't have those in our, in our uh, film sets. The other thing is that we, we have to make decisions not to film things because they're too fragile or they're something that the institution won't allow us to do. So just keep in mind when we talk about title lists, we can certainly provide title lists at the title level. We can provide a lot of time at the issue level, but there will always be gaps in, in, what, we, in what we hold. Um, and the, the final thing about page counts, page counts is probably the biggest nightmare that I have um, because... Do you worry about that? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a great example. We just did a product on American fiction. We did the analysis. We thought there was about 2 million pages. It turned out there was 5 million pages. And the reason was is because the group that was filming at the time decided to change the reduction ratio and, and create two what they call two-ups. So the film was actually double the amount of pages. So I think it's impossible for a publisher to come up with a, with a number. We can only use you know general numbers of, of pages. Yeah, I'm sure there will be limits to this. I think another thing, too, is about rights, I mean, especially with newspapers, in some cases you would have bought the rights to microfilm only. So there's then in that case, there's, there's no, really no potential for it to be digitized from your. I don't know about your, So I don't know about that, Bernie. I think that if the if the newspaper, I mean, that's part of our core business, is right, is clearing rights on this stuff. So if the newspaper is something that we want to um, digitize, um, there's two courses of action. One is is that many of our microfilm. Um, contracts do allow us either the right to first refusal to, to digitize it. Um, the other option is that we can go back to the right, right, the uh, rights holders and try to clear rights. And that's something the ProQuest legal office is as sticky as anything in terms of dotting the eyes, crossing the teeth on rights. Well, Just because you have it in the microphone doesn't mean you have the rights to digitize it or to do anything else with it. Um, so we're very, very about that. How about, are they okay about disclosing what rights you have for these things? I mean, if, you know, it, it's important to know for a particular title that you have a complete run or incomplete run, and even, even if we don't know you have a complete run, that if we know you have the rights, you know, what the nature of the rights are that you have in them, that, that's... <laughs> I would say for, for most of them, and I don't have a breakdown for you uh, today, for most of them we have to obtain rights, and even if we don't think we do. Our legal staff still makes us go to obtain rights. Yeah. So 
they're just, I mean, they are really stringent about that. So whether, you know, if we have rights, and I, you know, there's lots of collections where we think we have rights, and it says, and yes, you have all rights, they still make us go back and get rights to the contemporary publishers, because there's also a lot of orphan works that, that show up in there as well. Yeah. So we still go out and clear rights. We do it regardless. So that's something we're really, really stick with. It's somewhat of a priority for, for us as far as um, we're not going to go and find out what rights we hold for certain titles if we have no intention of digitizing. So a lot of times it's just that we've decided that this collection we want to use for a digital product. And at that point we go and find out specifically what the rights are. But we, don't, we do not have a good way to tell you right now if there was a collection in a microfilm vault exactly what the digital rights were because at that point nobody was thinking about digital. They were only thinking about filming. So we have to a lot of times go on a case-by-case -case basis and figure out what rights we have and then figure out to negotiate. And the other, other thing is one of quality. So it's like buying a house, leaky roof, buyer beware. Because when uh, some of this microfilm was microfilm 70 years ago, 40 years ago, some of it, the pages are blurry. I mean, literally, the pages are blurry, they're, the words go into the gutter, you know, the pages aren't straight. So some of it's just, it's not um, great quality. In fact, I don't even know how Peter, people read it on the reader because it's just, it's blurry when you see it. So some of it is just, it, it is what it is of the time it was created and the technology of the time. And usually we have masters that are copy, they're copy or so, but even then it's not, some of the pages aren't. Just a quick question. I think I know the answer to this, but I want to be clear. When you're, when you're talking about rights, you're talking about rights with the publisher, correct? Not the source library from which it was spelled? Both. Both, okay. Sure. Oh, yeah, source libraries were persnickety about as well. We always obtain the rights. I'm thinking the you have that libraries. same problem with historical um, records regarding yes. you know, right, you know, decisions made with the right. regarding sources of the promise that And the question was asked in the other room, is it just academic libraries? Or it's academic libraries, historical libraries, national libraries, public libraries, we, we obtain rights from all of them. To the extent they can give us the rights. Right. Sometimes they don't hold the rights. So we're actually going three, two places. We're going to where it was um, the source material, rights there, and it's also an, a publisher or an antecedent publisher because the source library doesn't always have the rights either to republish them. Well, well we, we've heard um, that in some cases the source library even will impose restrictions on the rights or will limit, <coughs> deliberately limit the rights that they grant to um, the ProQuest for Gale. We, you know, and we found that when we go back to some of the publishers going back, I had a conversation with Gale about this, about will we want to be able to text mine and data mine your databases. In many cases, it'll be the source library that's preventing that or the, that's right. you know, the in restrictions the source library Put on it that, and that's that's pernicious. But um, I mean, we've we've probably some of those source libraries here. Although I think you know most of the libraries, the whole libraries here, probably wouldn't impose those kind of restrictions on it. But but I know there are some independent research libraries out there that do because it's a revenue stream for them. They figure they sell the rights to digitize their serials to Gale. They're going to make more on royalties if those rights are limited. But then they can go back and Gale have to come back to them, or Profess have to come back to them and negotiate further rights. For that content, and that means more of a royalty it's stream. It's academic libraries too, Bernie. I mean, it's not just. Right? Oh, absolutely. Don't make me. I will. <laughs> but so I think you know the question is, how, does someone want? Does you know how do you want to monetize or not? And some do. I mean, I can tell you, and the, the national library, the British Library, you know, we pay them royalties. So yes. I mean, that's it's. How it's, it's take the British Library since they're not here, um, <laughs> as far as we know. And, um, what kind of restrictions they? I mean, are they one of those libraries that will say, you know, you can have the rights to reproduce for for this much, but then you, if you want the rights to text mining, you're going to charge more. Is that, is that you not experience so that? much for text mining, although there are other publishers that do, um, but not the British Library, not for text mining. And, and witness, I mean, early English books and the TCP project and yeah. XX Mine, and, and they're fine, and they were one of the contributors. So, from that point of view, they're fine. But, um, it varies. No, they, they have, uh, 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 there's license 
agreements are very stringent, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they get loyalty back um, on everything we've digitized there. So there's kind of an area where we're kind of hurting ourselves, I think, when we pick those. But the independent research libraries are in, are in a different place, I think, than, than a lot of us. The, I'm pursuing this line of argument or line of inquiry because of the conversation yesterday. In fact, it came up, the Brittle Books project came up yesterday, and the microphone that was done under NEH, um, prod, the NEH prod funded projects, and that um, those are a separate body of material. This is material that was microphone by the libraries, essentially. And is, um, but that was threatened um, because I mean, Susan Gibbons said, well, you know, RLG decides they're not going to pay the rent on the Iron Mountain storage anymore. So that means that the cost of it then has to be shoved back onto you know, in the libraries that have an interest, a stake, a stake in preservation of material. There's a, a large body of microform content, whether it's in the under control of commercial publishers or under control of, in some cases, libraries, in this case, RLG that I could help us cover a lot of the territory uh, in preserving, ensuring the long-term accessibility or at least long-term preservation of serial print materials. And I think we, we want to factor that into our planning. And um, we have begun to factor into our planning. We've been pushing for more disclosure of metadata from the microphone publishers and from the, the database publishers. And I think that, that's going to be really, really important. One of the um, items that came up this morning in the before the break and the discussion with the big libraries was, as I said, the value of the metadata that's being produced by the preservation, uh, by the digitization operations, and that includes the commercial digitization operations. These are operations when Gale micro or digitizes serials from the British Library or ProQuest digitizes newspapers from a, the American Antiquarian Society or, or some other place. That's a time when they're laying hands on the actual physical object, and that's a, t that's a t moment when every page is being inventory of someone's copy, of some copy of something. And so that's, that's extremely important validation data that we can use to compare with copies, other copies that might be the second copy archive or the third copy archive or that kind of thing. Or in some cases, like uh, at the, uh, when we digitize our early uh, European books at the DNF, uh, <coughs> they have different classification systems for each decade in each department. And so they don't even know what titles they're giving us up front mm -hmm. because we only don't know until after we've done the inventory and after we produce them. So it just depends on what the nature of the content of content it is and when and what library how old it is and then how it was classified at the time within the library so you know and, and to give the example it took 70 years to you know digitize uh, evo early english books and 17 million pages and we're still finding titles um, we thought that there would be 125,000 titles we've digitized 130,000 and we still find titles. In fact, when we met with the British Library with the, um, uh, the short title catalog, in the short title catalog, I think we've done about 90%, 91, 92-ish, but they're not sure because their catalog isn't complete either <laughs> and accurate. Well, the data so might be it's imperfect, as accurate as we it's, can get. It's, it's the best data we have. It's the best data we have. No, so that we, we know where it is. So that's we'll, where we are. So we'll be coming to you for that data. We'll but we're also digitizing <laughs> no a lot from print right now. Both of us. Um, it's not from my film. So, in contrast, um, on the early European side, we've already digitized 14 and a half million pages, 47,000 titles, I think it is, and we'll be at well beyond 17 um, by the end of this year. And that's directly from um, print. It's not. So, I think we have to talk both both areas. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's been important. And I'll just add, you know, for serials particularly, um, that's the single most um, expensive thing for, for us to capture. Um, there's lots of reasons for that, but think about the formats. You're talking about a lot of times broadside type type uh, items. The the print is not consistent over 
um, run, so they change it from a weekly to a bi-weekly, or a new publisher came in and changed the format. And they're also very, very dense. You know, it's not like a monograph where you have you know, some, some text on a page. You have a lot of um, dense pages. And in the case of, uh, of us, in the case of Gale, we're segmenting on every single article within those newspapers. So it is um, a very cost prohibitive thing for us to do. However, the usage shows that it's probably, they're probably the most <coughs> used parts of the, the content sets that we add. So we understand the value, but it's also very cost prohibitive to, to do large runs of these newspapers unless there's a need in the market for us to do it. So I guess the message that I want to get across there is that I do think there's an opportunity at CRL and other um, groups like this to kind of put some pressure back on us to say, here are the things that are worthwhile doing in your vault. Because we're not going to go just look through the vault and decide, oh, you know what, let's go do that newspaper. We need a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think you guys have an opportunity to do that because of the you know, group that you put together and obviously you know, the forum that you've, you've given us today. That's interesting. It's a little, it echoes a little bit of what we said in the previous conversation with Deanna and, and um, Craig from Clocks that there's, there's an opportunity for this community to help prioritize. Any questions, comments? Before we end? Okay, well, I, I appreciate your being here. Thank you, Ray, and Susan. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks, everybody.